It is 9.30 and for all those people tuning out home, welcome. Uh, it's a brand new year and things seem to change. There's a new president in the United States. Um, the things change constantly but then things remain the same as well. It's great having you here. Um, we're going to be... Something that stays the same is that we're now gathering around God's word. And when we were gathering around God's word, we're actually gathering around Jesus. It's the thing that makes us come. Without Jesus, this is a bizarre meeting. <laughs> but because Jesus is Lord and Saviour, because Jesus is the only answer to a lot of the issues that we find out there, that's why we come. So today I'm hoping you're going, to be, you're going to be hearing God's word. I'm hoping you'll be encouraged. I'm hoping you'll be challenged. And I'm hoping that as, when we leave here, we'll be encouraged to continue in believing in Christ and continue doing the work that he has. So let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you do gather your people and that we are here uh, to worship you together as your church. Lord, just ask that you be with us today. May your spirit be upon us. May we hear your word, not only from the front, but from each other's lips, so that we can be encouraged to keep on keeping on in you. Amen. Friends, before we um, uh, continue, uh, something significant happened this week. Um, you know, our brother uh, Michael and Vicky uh, Leedow, their, uh, their mum, Reen, died uh, two days ago. So, uh, yeah, that's quite sad for them. It's um, a little bit unexpected. There's a little bit of hope in, in that story as well, which I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear as well. But just to let you know, um, their funeral is going to be this Thursday. Uh, at, they're going to have a small service, family only, at the crematorium, but then here there's a memorial service at 11 a.m. If you are planning to go and you're not a relative, can you ring me? Because we do have, um, if the health order stays the same, we can only have 54, uh, 74 people in this hall and the next hall, and we've only got a maximum of 100 people for a funeral. So if you're not family, can you ring me so just so I can say yes uh, so that we can keep our COVID safety things um, uh, ticked? So if you're planning to be there and you're not close family, um, ring, ring me. My phone number's on the back of... It's on the newsletter. And if, you, if you're here today and you haven't got my phone number and you want to come, just let me know before the end of the day. Um, do you mind if I pray for Vicky and, and all the lead hours at the moment? Okay, please pray with me. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, uh, it's times like these we are reminded that we are but just missed on earth. We can't, we are born, we're here for a while and then we die. And Lord, I just thank you for uh, Reen's life. I thank you for all that she has done for her family and all, all her friends. But Lord, in this time, may I, I just pray for Mike and Vicky and uh, Bob in this time of grief and this time of shock. Lord, I just ask that you, uh, you comfort them, that your promise of eternal life is ringing in their ears. Lord, in these moments, there is no hope except hope in you. So, Lord, I just pray that you be with the whole lead our family and those that are close to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, we're going to start, we're going to continue our James series. This is the last um, uh, one in James, except that we're going to be doing James next week, but it's the house party. It's going to be a little bit different, but in terms of reading it, Every chapter, this will be the, uh, the last week of doing that. So uh, Steve Gribble is going to come up and read James 1. Um, and so, again, if it helps, close your eyes and listen. 
Uh, if it helps, if you like reading, follow along reading. But again, the, part, part of the idea is not to try and concentrate too hard, but let God's word enter your ears, into your mind, into your heart. And that, that is the... Um, that, that is the, why we do what we're doing at the moment. Okay, so Steve, if you, as Steve's come up, let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you speak to us, that you have not left us uh, in the dark, but you've come and revealed yourself to us. Lord, as we read your word today, may we hear your voice. Amen. Thank you, Steve. James chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he has created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted planted in you, you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world.
is good, it's ever faithful, worth more than gold, the heart's delight, your work is life to all who hear and obey, your word endures forever, your word is true, it never changes. It formed the earth, sustains it still. Your word defends, providing refuge and strength. Your word endures forever. Your word is a lamp unto my Reading again, chapter 2. Uh, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favouritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, he is a good seat for you, but you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? He promised those who love him. 
but you have dishonoured the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favouritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did? when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Prayer is a conversation with God, and a conversation is just talking. That means prayer is just talking to God. And God loves having conversations. He wants to have a conversation with you all the time. The best part? You'll never interrupt God. He's not busy at work. He's not busy eating dinner. He's not busy editing his photos. He is always ready to have a conversation with you. Always. Anytime and anywhere. Because you matter to God. reading James. James chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. 
when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take sheep, ships, not sheep, ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to see everyone. Uh, in, in fact, uh, that's what I want to speak about. Um, it's great that so many of us are able to get to this service. And as we are thinking about uh, how we go forward this year, um, we're reaching our capacity. And so we've been thinking for a little while about how we might structure things um, in a sustainable way going forward. And what I wanted to uh, invite you to do this morning is to think, think with me about uh, whether uh, this proposal would be workable. Um, and that is that we uh, more or less revert to our pre-COVID timing for services. An early service and a 10 a.m. service roughly and a 5 p.m. service. Um, that I think will allow us to do a number of things. Um, uh, first of all, uh, to love one another by providing, I think, at the earlier service an environment that's uh, for uh, perhaps people who uh, have uh, perhaps uh, some compromised immune or they're, they're concerned um, most primarily about uh, their mixing with others. Uh, because at the moment there are a number of families who choose to not come along because they can't be sure of what their kids will or won't be able to cope with. And the parents are concerned that uh, kids mixing with older people or people with compromised immune systems um, might be a problem. So it seems to me by uh, perhaps separating out those two groups and having, having our eight o'clock or thereabouts service um, aimed at uh, those who are particularly have that need and that would free up room for kids to come back at 10. One of our problems, though, is that between our services we need to clean this area. In fact, all of our gates and, and, and uh, things. So we're actually going to need a little bit more time, I think, between the services. 
So what we're thinking about at the moment incorporates that. It also incorporates the problem we've been having with Facebook, uh, it's Facebook YouTube, sorry, Facebook. Um, they've been uh, cutting off our stream at 10 o'clock um, and it seems like a whole bunch of churches or other people are starting to uh, starting to YouTube at that time. So we're thinking if we try to start on the hour, we'd get a full hour in before they chopped us off again. So what I'm thinking about is 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and that would give us enough time to clean between the services. So would you have a think about that? Let me know. I want to stress that I haven't pulled the trigger on this. We're not definitely doing it yet. And even if we were to pull the trigger on it, we just need a few weeks to get that in place. So it probably wouldn't happen until the end of February in any case. This time of year, we're all kind of gearing up. Yep, school starts this week. Can I hear it? <laughs> um, so if you've got uh, particular uh, comments about that, I'll be hanging around outside or send me an email during the week. Uh, I'd love to hear what you've got to think about that. Um, and 5pm as well. Of course, we have more capacity this year in terms of congregational leadership because Tom has come on board. And it's great to, be, uh, great to hear um, Theo and Sebastian up there. Um, Tom's actually away at the moment at a leadership in training camp, and it's great that he's been able to plug our, our parish into that, um, uh, that great uh, organisation as well. He'll be back uh, this afternoon. Uh, house party next weekend. Church will be on as normal. 9.30 a.m. and uh, John will be taking that uh, and I'll be trying to be in two places at once. Um, uh, we'll have a recorded sermon here and we'll have a very similar sermon uh, down at the house party as well. If you're going on the house party, uh, looking, I'm looking forward to it. You should have got an email about that. If you haven't received an email, please let myself or Leah know. Um, I think that's probably it, John. Thanks. Just on that, um, n normally school starts next week, or it actually starts on the Friday, but um, we would normally start our youth group on that Friday, but because of the house party, we're just going to delay it a week, so um, parents with kids going to youth group, uh, yeah, youth group starts the week after, and also kids' church stuff will start the week after as well, so that'll all gear up. So, um, so yeah, so that's... Um, Hopefully we've got a, a new and exciting team. And as that comes, we'll, we'll be praying and letting people know what's happening. Okay, next Bible reading. Thank you, Kathy. James chapter 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? You desire, but you don't have. So you kill. You covet, but you can't get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but he shows favour to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, 
but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbour? Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. And lastly, James chapter 5. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. And their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count it as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise you will be condemned. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing so songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crop. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. I want you to pray with me. Father, as we come uh, towards the end of this book of James, would you continue to increase, uh, to give us more grace? Uh, help us to take on board what you're saying to us, that we might live uh, as Jesus followers, and that we might help others to come and find the great joy it is to know him and to be changed by him. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, today I think we come to what's the fundamental, the bedrock issue that James has been driving at uh, in this letter, and that is our God complex, or spiritual pride. But I actually don't think many of us, if any of us, think of ourselves this way, because the thing about pride is that it hides itself from the truth, from the light of day. It hides in the murk at the bottom of our heart, where we don't actually go very often. And what that does is that it puts itself behind other things, and holds onto them. So you can't, you can't get at pride directly. You, you see its effects. 
And that's what James has been doing all the way through the book as we've been working our way through it. We've seen that behind our double-mindedness and worldliness is pride. That we'd hear bits of the word but not do the word is pride. That we'd prefer some kinds of people and not other kinds of people, that's pride. That we lack love or we've got poisonous tongues, that's pride. Pride's the most spiritual, uh, potent spiritual undoing since the garden. Remember, remember the garden at the beginning? God's word was specific, very clear. But the serpent said, nah, when you eat that fruit, your eyes will be opened and you'll become like God and me. you know good and evil. Not in the sense of uh, um, doing or experiencing good and evil, but in the sense of determining good and evil. And at the heart of every experience outside the garden, at the heart of our lives is our desire to play God. In all kinds of ways, mostly unrecognised. Basically to get him off the throne and get us up there. And the most mature Christians I've met confess to struggling with this hard. It was the first sin in the world and it'll be the last one to be rooted out. And James' picture, the reason it's so hard for us is because that's what we're like. We're all the same when it comes to pride. And, and James is written to Christians, ordinary Christian believers like us. Because actually it's only when you become a believer in Jesus that you begin to struggle with spiritual pride day by day. C.S. Lewis, um, a Christian writer, says, The essential vice, the utmost evil, is pride. Unchastity or anger, greed, drunkenness and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. Now flea bites are very annoying. Just ask John and myself, we got bitten to death a couple of weeks ago. Um, but it's through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice, says Lewis. It's the complete anti-God state of mind. And it doesn't come from our animal nature, but from hell. And it's therefore far more subtle and effective. And James loves his readers and he wants to warn them, this is our most difficult battle, brothers and sisters. And in the couple of paragraphs we're looking at today, I think James shows three pictures, uh, basically where the battle is at in church and in our lives and with money. And so I've got a few things to say about each of those three different areas, church, life and money. Now have a look at verse 10, chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he'll lift you up. That's the basic word for today. Listen and take on what James is saying and change. Of verse 11, brothers and sisters, don't slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who's able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbour? Uh, now this is how this section works. James isn't moralising, saying do this rule and don't do that bad thing. Speaking against a brother or sister, literally in the original, is speaking from above, speaking over. See, whenever you put someone down and put yourself up, you're actually speaking against the law of God, he goes on to say. You're bad-mouthing God because you've assumed the status of God, the judge. You've looked at them with your measure from your you know, elevated status and found them wanting, and so you've condemned them, and you've done it behind their backs most likely, so, you know, you can kid yourself that no one's actually been hurt. And James says the only way to do that is if you push God off the throne, and you climb up there yourself, 
I've got this one, God. I'll, I'll set the standard. And it's very important to see what James is doing here. See, James identifies this, but his, his solution is not moralism. He doesn't appeal to, um, you know, propriety. Yeah, it's not polite to do that, so don't do it. Um, it. It's not pragmatism that he appeals to. You'll never have a close and warm Christian community if you do that. Um, he, 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 he doesn't even say this is a sin against love. He says it's a sin against humility. You're making yourself something that you're not. The problem is, you see, it's ultimately directed against God. Verse 12, the question there is exactly the right question. Who are you? You're not the lawgiver. I'm not the lawgiver. Only one person is properly able to judge and destroy. And James's point is this, that every time we gossip or say something snide about someone else, or denigrate others. I am playing God. And so there's only one way forward, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he'll lift you up. And you know, I probably need to say something about humility as well. We probably have the wrong idea about humility often. Humility is not... You know, the shy, introverted person. I mean, we all know the introverts will take over the world. Isn't that true? Yes. How loud that was. Um, <laughs> humility is not peace at any price kind of weakness. Humility is facing the truth. All I am and all I have has been given to me. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he'll lift you up. Jonathan Edwards was a seriously important preacher and theologian in the United States at the beginning of the 18th century. And in his lifetime, he saw whole towns turn back to Jesus. Um, many, many people came to faith in Jesus in the time that he lived in the US. And uh, he's a funny, funny guy. He, he never varied his tone in preaching or told stories or stuff like that. And he always wrote out his sermons longhand and his eyesight wasn't that great. So he'd, he'd hold it up here like this and read his sermons that way. John, maybe we should try that for a few weeks. <laughs> um, Edwards wrote a paper about revival and his comment is very telling. He said, you know, what stops most revivals in his experience... It was Christians fighting and bad-mouthing each other. And, and that pride was the main way that the devil has got hold of religious people. And he writes up a bunch of ways that works. Here are a couple. When you speak about a person's faults with bitterness or laughter or contempt, that's pride. Christian humility, on the other hand, is seen and going to them and speaking, speaking to them with mercy and, and, and tears. The second little picture was a spiritually proud person is very quick to see the faults in others. A humble person is quick to reckon others better than themselves. And they're so busy with God's things and aware of the evil in their own hearts that they think no one's got more reason to thank God than they do. third little picture, spiritual pride takes very quick notice of any perceived injury to themselves. They're very easily aggravated. Whereas humility concerns itself with injury that others have suffered. And fourth, the spiritually proud person thinks everyone wants their help and most likely goes around instructing others, you know, like a kind of consultant. Um, and the humble person, on the other hand, carries with them an air of a disciple. And their question is, what can I do to better honour God? How can I learn what it means to follow Jesus? And there, I think, is the application of chapter 4 to our tongues. The prime instrument of exhibiting our pride. Don't play God to others at church. Humble yourself before the Lord. And he will exalt you. Well, the second and third area is quite quickly, secondly, 
we play God in our lives. I think verses 13 to 17 pick this up. Now listen, you who say tomorrow or today we'll go and do this, go to this city, spend a year there, carry on business, make money, while you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we'll live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, and all such boastings are evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's sin for them. And the Bible's not against planning, strategic planning. It's not against trading or making profit. The issue James is picking up on here is much deeper, and it's spiritual. So here's a person um, doing what everyone does. I mean, they're pretty confident about when and location and where they're going and, and the outcome and what's going to happen. But what strikes me about verse 13 is it's also normal. Because <laughs> that's what we do all the time, isn't it? And I think that's the point. See, we, we live naturally as if we're master of our own fate captain of our own ship and I don't bring God into the short term future planning, I mean of course he's there for the long term so that I'll go to heaven but between now and then you know I've got the responsibility and I'm going to kind of take responsibility and make plans to do this and that and and I play God Truth, truth is the fact that our times, not just long term but medium term and short term, every moment, the fact that our times are in his hands ought to be the most comforting thing for us. It ought to take away all kinds of anxieties about the future. Oh, I think that sins of spiritual pride are much more likely to be sins of omission. We just leave God out. We leave God out of our thinking. Or well, thirdly, playing God with wealth. Spiritual pride shows how we play God in church, with our lives, and lastly with wealth. James chapter 5 starts off with these words. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that's coming on you. James is talking to the financially rich and it's very strong language and I think probably the easiest way for us to tune this out is to you know, dial a richer meter just to kind of a few thousand dollars above you know, our annual income. And on the other hand, it's very easy for me to make us feel guilty about money. It's a very soft target. Probably the reality is that we're all rich, just living in Australia. But the point of raising this topic is that, well, according to Jesus, there's something uniquely spiritually hazardous about money. Because money cooperates with our spiritual pride. And the Apostle Paul says, at the end of 1 Timothy 6, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So there's, highly, there's something highly spiritually risky about wealth. It colludes with our God complex. And can I just say again, look, the Bible's not anti-wealth or anti-the wealthy. It doesn't take a class approach to looking at the world. You know, that group of people are evil, more evil than others, whether rich or poor. See, Abraham is held up as an example in James. Fabulously wealthy. He trusted God. I think wealth is the perfect arena to hide our spiritual pride. And James says, we hide our spiritual pride in the way money affects us, in the way we acquire it, and the way we use it. And look at verses 2 and 3. Your wealth has rotted, moths have eaten your clothes, your gold and silver are corroded, their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You've hoarded wealth in the last days. And those words rot and moths and rust, corrosion, they highlight the lack of use of wealth for God that will testify over time. We know it's the last days. Uh, 
the days before Jesus' return. And holding on to resources rather than letting the urgency of our time inform how we use money is just laying up for yourself treasure on earth, not in heaven. So the question that, that comes here is, are you rich towards God? That's, that's the problem that James is pointing out with these people. C.S. Lewis again, pride is competitive by its very nature. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next person. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good looking, but they're not. They're proud of being richer, cleverer or better looking than others. See, pride's the pleasure of being above the rest. And that explains why a rich person never has enough money. They just want more, to be more rich than the next person. That's the first test of where the money's got hold of us. The second is injustice. Look at verse 4. Look, the wages you've failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. See, when we acquire money unjustly, that matters to God. And there are lots of ways to acquire money unjustly. But let me talk about modern day slavery slavery for just a moment. The clothes we wear, the products we buy. Some of them are made by people who are held in bondage. The endless stories of agricultural workers in Australia, underpaid, extorted. And more than one of our ready-made food delivery companies in Australia have never turned a profit because you cannot deliver its product and make a profit in Australia. But we keep on paying $2 for a delivery. And it's likely that whenever you buy a computer or a phone or clothing or fish or rice or even chocolate, that something in that product comes from exploited labour in China or Malaysia or other nations. That's just talking to us. And it's very difficult. Because what's your choice? Our position in the world is even built on those injustices in history. And as we approach Australia Day, that's behind a lot of the heat to do with the date. The three areas that James highlights, hoarding money for ourselves, how we acquire wealth, and the third little area is self-indulgence, verse 5 and 6. You've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You've fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered the innocent one who wasn't opposing you. And, and this is what every advertisement we see appeals to in us. The luxury lifestyle. For me. And, and part of the sadness is that wealth can be used for great good. And when we appear before the judgment seat of Christ, it'll be an awful time if what we've hoarded is what he speaks to us about. What'd you do with the wealth I gave you? Verse 6 isn't easy to translate, but it's something like, <laughs> Have you not murdered and condemned the righteous one? Does he not oppose you? And I think that's probably speaking about Jesus, actually. See, Jesus is telling you now, do not live this way. Do not think of money as being primarily for self-indulgence, or for you. The godly are not those who think less of themselves, but people who think of themselves less, who put others and community before themselves. And the godly person holds wealth with an open hand, not a clenched fist. And we can't know each other's hearts. And let me urge you not to go around judging others. But I think the passage calls us to humble ourselves before the Lord. So there we go, James 4. Spiritual pride. If we're playing God by putting others down, we need to own up and repent. If we're playing God with our lives... 
living and planning as if God's irrelevant, just leaving him out, the same. And James 5, if we're playing God with money, turn around. And you know, all that turning around is only ever going to be the work of the Spirit in someone. Listen to Lewis again. A proud man cannot know God. Because a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you can't see something that's above you. James is not moralising. As if you can make yourself good enough for the God who sent his son for you. He loves you. This is love that he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice. And so James's word to us is humble yourselves before this one and he'll lift you up. And that is great news. Thanks, John. Okay, into a time of prayer now. Irene, are you down? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, we pray that you will mercifully look upon our weaknesses. Please help us as we face the dangers of this world and stretch out your right hand to help us and defend us. We pray that you will give us the gift of joy in our service of God and in our service of people. Almighty and eternal God, we know that you alone are the source of power and influence. We ask that you give us strength and joy in serving you as followers of Jesus Christ. We thank you that the restrictions that are in place for Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane have worked to suppress the spread of the virus in each of these cities, and we pray that this good news may continue. We continue to pray for many parts of our world that is experiencing all kinds of troubles and strife as this world pandemic continues into a second year. We pray for all countries and nations who have been afflicted by COVID-19, both via the loss of thousands of lives as well as in economic terms. We pray especially for the current worst affected countries impacted by the virus. The United States of America, India, Brazil, Russia, the United Kingdom, France, Turkey, Italy, Spain, Colombia and Germany as well as many more countries around the world where the virus has continued to spread. We thank you that the spread of the virus has lessened in some countries which had previously been impacted. We pray that the approved vaccines will be effectively administered in these countries and work to eradicate the spread of the virus in communities. We pray for our neighbour, Indonesia, as it has experienced a series of fatal natural disasters, earthquakes, landslides and volcanic eruptions this month. Many lives have been lost and tens of thousands of people have been impacted and displaced. As Indonesia is already badly affected by the coronavirus, these natural disasters place extra burdens on this country and its government. We ask that you will keep your church in Indonesia strong as these trials continue and that 
you will use this period of great tragedy and trial for good to bring people to knowledge of yourself. We also thank you that there was a peaceful transition of government in the United States. And we pray that this new administration will seek to effectively address the deep rooted social and economic divisions that underlie American society. Again, we ask you, Lord God, to restrain Satan's stronghold in countries and nations around the world, including our own, and use for the, and use for the glory of your name for good everything that Satan intends for harm. We ask you in your goodness, Lord, to comfort and sustain all who, who in this transitory and fragile life are in any kind of trouble, sorrow, need, sickness and other adversity. We take the time now to bring to you in prayer those that we know who have been impacted by the virus and its effects on business and society, relatives, strangers, friends and neighbours who are sick or suffering before you. Gracious Father, have mercy on their lives and use us to bring comfort to them. In life and action, may we love our neighbours as we love ourselves. May we seek to live reconciled lives with each other and be the first to forgive if we feel that we have been harmed in any way. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. Let's now say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
come sweeping through us. Revive your church with life and power. Dear friends, that brings us to the end of uh, church formally. Uh, we're going to uh, break up. Can, can I please ask you, have few conversations but deeper rather than lots of conversations superficially. Um, another challenge I'd like to give you this week, we can't gather normally so community is hard. So I know some of you are doing it already and I thank you for that. But if you haven't been, think of someone to ring t- this week. Ask them how they're going. Ask them how they're going with the Lord. So again, just this week, remember Church does, uh, our Sundays don't function as like it used to. We need to make up for it during the week. So, and guess what? We all have to do that. So can I challenge you to do that? Okay, before we finish, may the peace of God which trans all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Friends, have a great week. And remember, next week we will have 9.30 service here uh, and it's also going to be communion. So uh, so please, uh, and communion will also be done at the house party as well. Sorry? Five, and five o'clock today if, uh, for those that want to have a bit more of a Bible study type uh, church service this afternoon. So great. Okay, have a great week.